the start show. Hi, good day all, um, and thank you for joining us for today's panel discussion. Um, today's event is a collaboration between the Emancipatory Future Studies Program and the, excuse me, the Research Group on Political Economy of War Systems from Brazil, Bastos and War Society, the Ecological Dimension of Modern War Systems Crisis. Um, and today's panel is part of this Global Disasters Conference. Uh, this conference aims to bring together scholars, activists, politicians, and government officials to share ideas and analysis of the current climate crisis from a world historical perspective and to make plans for survival and mitigation. And in this panel, we have four speakers, um, Feral Adam, Fredson Guilengue, Patrick Bond and Vishwa Sadka. Uh, each of our speakers will have 15 minutes to present, and then we will open up the panel for discussion from the audience. Um, beginning with our first speaker, Dr. Farrell Adam, who is a leading climate justice activist in South Africa and a water activist. She leads a national campaign in response to South Africa's water disasters, and she's also the Climate Risk and Disaster Secretary of the Climate Justice Charter movement. I am the chair of today's panel, and my name is Awande Butelezi, and I am the International Secretary of the Climate Justice Charter Movement. So without much further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Farrell Adam. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Comrade Awande. Um, I'm going to go straight into my, my presentation and share my screen quickly. Just let me know if everyone can see it. Uh, your presentation is visible. Okay. So, um, sorry, I'm just canceling my timer, but you will tell me when I'm going overboard. I'm going to change, I'm not going to, I'm going to put my video off if that's okay. okay. Good. Okay, so I'm talking about um, the water disaster that we're experiencing in South Africa, but also I think we have to talk about it in a global perspective. Um, and I'm looking at, I'm going to be setting the scene for looking at what exists, what, what we're going through, and then also try to look at some of the things that we are doing as the CJCM to get to a point of water sovereignty and democracy. Okay. Some of the things that I would talk about in terms of we cannot look at water just as a very localized kind of picture. We have to look at the global picture and, and the things that are affecting uh, democratization of water and also affecting the impacts on our water, which is nationalism, the rise of the right wing, uh, necrocapitalism, which I will explain, uh, things like war, finance, um, science and inequality. So those are the kinds of things I would quickly touch on. Um, and uh, let's start with nationalism. I mean, I didn't think we would be seeing this kind of image again with Trump on the rise again in the US, which is really problematic for eco-socialism and climate justice, water justice. Um, so it remains a key impediment to successful climate and water justice. It's deciding basically how governments are working. We're seeing an increase of xenoph xenophobic reactions that is making countries very inward looking and it's dangerous, especially regarding water where many countries share borders and share water resources. Um, so in terms of, you know, in, if you look at how this relates in 2021, the world's biggest emitters and probably biggest polluters spent 2.3 times as much on arming their borders than on climate. Um, and we cannot talk about water without also talking about climate. And I think that um, there's a global climate and water dam wall, a, a kind of invisible one, but exists that seals off powerful countries from what we would call migrants, 
rather than addressing the cause of displacement. But also, um, this is a problem because we're seeing that people are, you know, they're scrounging to control and privatize water resources and own water resources uh, globally. So people, it's again a case of the ones that have polluted the most are now looking for clean sources of water that they can control. So it's a very pro big business agenda. Um, and this kind of view, this kind of behavior is affecting, I think, public views on water. Um, the rise of the right, right wing, it's, it's everywhere. So this is, I love this map because it gives you an idea of the world according to the right wing and, you know, labeling everyone. And I think for me, the thing that's important is to look at the part of Africa where you either terrorists or you are, you know, not important because that area is full of disease and hunger. Um, if you look at South America where everyone's illegal. Um, so it kind of creates this rush of people of the South and and how, how they actually see the world. And that is actually how then um, it affects our, our our struggles, right? So the issue of necrocapitalism, which is a term used by um, Banerjee, I think from 2008 or 2001, sorry if I forget the timing, but basically it's a form of capitalism where um, everything is linked to and dependent directly or indirectly on death and the prof profits accruing from it. So for example, if you look at something like Monsanto, which promoted GM for decades and didn't bother about the environmental impact, the human impact. So complete ecocide because of the way that that sector or that industry wants to operate. So there's resource extraction and resulting in the death of the people and planet. Um, other sectors, of, of course, as military, uh, big pharmacy. I mean, the amount of pharmaceuticals in our water and in everything that we do is is so harmful but obviously they don't care commercial farming mining um so the so so the the whole thing of biopolitics being free but not quite free and it's also looking at continuing to pollute and profit that's the key thing this it discredits public health it discredits what people are saying, um, and we're seeing it all the time. So how does that, you know, relate? I mean, it doesn't relate, but you have that, and then you have the state of our water commons, which is very concerning. So if you start layering all of these as if they maps, it creates quite a bleak picture. Um, by 2025, Africa's water crisis is predicted to become a catastrophe if it hasn't already because of what we've been going through, because of the denialist uh, that, it, you know, a lot of what we're dealing with is climate because of the world that is polluting, not stepping up and doing what they need to do rightfully in terms of uh, mitigation and adaptation processes. Um, so, you know, 230 million Africans will be facing water scarcity. And of course, if you look at that map that I showed you in the beginning, they don't care. Up to 460 million will be living in water stressed areas. It is only when it starts affecting the north, then it becomes a big issue. There will definitely be increased food insecurity and poverty. It's going to be even worse than we're seeing right now. So, of course, we have water injustice. And at least 2 billion people use a drinking water source that's contaminated with feces. At least a million people a year die from diarrhea uh, and, and directly because of unsafe drinking water. And this is happening in developing countries and countries of the South. So there's not much of a focus. If this starts going into the North, then of course, this too, it will be a bit bigger focus. But my other fear is that then privatization would be um, like a fast jet that we won't even know what hit us. So in terms of climate change, we cannot talk about water without you know looking at climate change. and. UNICEF has basically said that change in climate is felt primarily through a change in water. So 74% of natural disasters between 2001 and 2018 were water-related, and we've seen some of that. Droughts, floods, the frequency and intensity has increased all around. Um, 
By 2040, almost one in four children will live in water vulnerable areas. That's a quarter of the population. Um, disasters destroy or contaminate, and that adds to the, 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 poor, the poor quality we have. And that brings us to South Africa. So I did a whole, what it looks like globally, it is impacting, and this is how it's impacting us nationally, is that South Africa could have a far a water crisis far worse than the energy one. And, and that is what we're starting to see now. We're in the middle of it. And let me explain a little bit about that. Um, we live in a very, very broken and divided country. Let's be honest. And the way the water issues then seep in is also very broken and very divided. I'm going to zap through this because I just got a message saying that I got halfway through. Um, we also have this picture that I've shown previously. And Patrick, you'll be happy to know I've taken the one picture out. Um, shows one week in South Africa in terms of climate shocks that we've experienced. A lot of that water related. So the drought pictures from the Eastern Cape, the two flood pictures, KZN, Western Cape, and the fires of Western Cape. So these things are happening more frequently. We're seeing that the rains are quite heavy. Um, and then, of course, the quality and quantity of water in South Africa. And the recent stats show that um, even South Africa, we will not have enough to meet demand by 2025, which, by the way, is a few months away. We lose 44% of our clean drinking water. In fact, it's close to 50% through um, leaks, through non-billable uh, water, and through theft. High levels of, of pollution that's not being monitored. Of course, we all know about sewage because government right now is the biggest polluter of our rivers and streams. Mining and agriculture and pharmaceuticals are literally getting away with murder. The things that are going into our water are not being policed properly or enforced um, and no one's going to jail, no one's being charged, and then it's just going on and on and on. Our river ecosystems are therefore in not a healthy state. 60% of, of our ecosystems are threatened, and this is mostly human-caused, um, exacerbated by climate. And then, of course, when we talk about water injustice, we have to look at the access to water in South Africa. If you ask anyone in government, they will very proudly say, that 93% of South African population have access to water supply services and 76 of the population have access to basic sanitation. We have to break down what they mean by access because in a country where only 46% of households have a tap inside their home, and if you break that down even more, less of that 46% can actually use the water because recent Green Drop and Blue Drop report shows that half of South Africa's drinking water systems are not drinkable and should not be used. Uh, so that then reduces that percentage. Uh, communal taps, which do not work. And then 9%, but I think now it's 10% uh, survive or need to access water from springs, rivers, and wetlands, which, by the way, are highly polluted. So this is the blue drop, green drop report. Blue drop is drinking water, green drop is wastewater. This is the report that comes from government. It's not looking good. Our systems are in a critical uh, and dire state uh, with high levels of sewage pollution into our rivers. And more and more, our tap water is becoming undrinkable. This is basically just a map, the, the one on the left, is showing government's map and the state of effluent into our rivers and streams. And the one on the right is us using citizen science as a form, as one way to build from below and actually start monitoring and holding governments accountable. There is an onslaught of our water in South Africa. We've got shortages of chlorine. Towns and cities are being close to day zero, but where is the media focus as it was on Cape Town? More and more places should be giving boil water notices, but are not. If you're traveling to Northwest, Northern Cape, Free State, do not drink the water in the tap. High levels of E. coli in our beaches, so even our marine life is being affected. Rising acid mine drainage, because governments just lost the plot. They can't keep track. And now what we have are water cuts, water shedding, water shifting, call it what you like. 
Ran Water as a, board, a water board and Joba Water as the local government entity are falling apart and cannot keep track. This is what's happening. We're seeing uh, cholera cases last year, which should not have happened. Uh, that was because of corruption, mismanagement of, of funds. And we're seeing this more and more, right? Um, we have water that's not drinkable. Municipalities are not telling people not to drink the water. So you're going to get more and more people getting sick. For once, at least we're seeing government taking companies like Sassel, who knowingly polluted the Val River system with chemicals that are cancer-causing and harmful and that are still being found in soil and water samples. Really concerning. We have wastewater treatment works that are just not operating. And then, of course, we have a mayor who says there is no water crisis. He has no idea what is going on. He keeps saying civil society are alarmist, but really, given the state of our water, we have to be alarmist. People, the one good thing is that people are rising across class, across race. We are, you know, it's the one thing that we can use to unify and create awareness around water justice, water injustice, and climate justice. And I think this is something that we should look at how we build from below using the water struggles across the country. Uh, as, as Vish said in an article, we need to build from below. Uh, dark times do clash with hope-based resistance, and that is exactly what I've shown. We've got we've 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 kind of reached a point of disaster in terms of supply and management and the systems, but the resistance is rising. We need to strengthen that local resistance. And also we need to amplify this across border. The fact that no one said anything about South Africa and Zimbabwe signing an MOU that Zimbabwe will sell us water, but people in Harare go for eight hours a day without water uh, is unacceptable. We need to move away from climate celebrity activism and to actual, you know, getting things done. Time is just not on our side. Um, the CJCM is an alternative that can work. We need to push and we need to look at the CJCM in all our policies. We need to comment when government comes out with policies and add in our CJCM alternative policies, which basically define the commons, creates, we need to create education awareness around issues. We talk about an activist citizen science that can empower people at a local level um, to build uh, from below we need to challenge policy framework, look at water pricing. We need to guard against privatization. Promise this thing is seeping in. We are fighting this wave of private. It's waiting at the doors. I cannot tell you how every day private companies are coming in. There's a whole, like the, the mayor said things today that's really concerning. The free basic water allocation is reducing. We need to keep track of that. Inequality is seriously high. I'm wrapping up um, and I went really fast. We also need to challenge how water is allocated because the large corporate consumers get a lot of it and um, they're not, they not accountable, uh, held accountable when, it, when they pollute and, and what they do with, their, you know, with the amount of water that they have. It's, it's absolutely criminal. We have to stand up against that. Um, by the way, just one more thing, the inequality. They keep talking about this 280 liters per person per day. They talk about 183 uh, liters per person per day in Johannesburg. This is nonsense. Yes, there is high usage, but we need to break that down according to the wealthier areas, the poorer areas, and then break it down further uh, between residents and industry and mining. We cannot be lumped in with this big figure if we don't know that mining industry are using more and that wealthier areas are using three times the amount of poorer areas then you can hold people accountable equally. So conclusion, I'm gonna, you know, we have to be on high alert. We need to build the movement. We need collective voices. We need to have media visibility and demand accountability. I'm finished. Oh, I wonder, you put me under pressure there. <laughs> Apologies for that, um, but you were able to get through some really important points and I really hope that the thrust and content of your presentation um, was taken in by all as it was by me.
Um, our next speaker is Fredson Gelenge. Uh, Fredson, and he also works as a senior program manager for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Johannesburg. Uh, Fredson, you... So I think you're still on mute. Yeah. Um, uh, hello. Uh, good morning. I hope you um, you you can you can can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Uh, bon dia. If, if, if for, for those who are actually following us uh, in Portuguese, and um, my presentation is based on my uh, uh, thesis. Um, and I'm just going to share some insights uh, with you guys. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, for this for this panel, which is which is um, very interesting. Uh, my um, research has to do with, uh, I mean, focus on trying to understand how uh, societies uh, uh, respond uh, to uh, um, the, um, uh, I mean, uh, shocks uh, of. Uh, cyclonic uh, events um, in the context of climate change. Um, by doing so, I uh, my research question has uh, was um, how did uh, trying to understand how did Mozambique, the Mozambican state in particular, and progressive social movement uh, organizations um, in Mozambique um, respond to the effects of cyclone um, uh, cyclone Idai. Um, as you guys uh, may know, Cyclone Idai hit Mozambique in, in, in 2019, uh, resulting in uh, 600 uh, deaths and, 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 and also uh, destruction of infrastructure. Almost 75% uh, of the town of Beira was destroyed. And uh, still today, uh, lots of infrastructure are still um, uh, um, being uh, reconstructed. So, And the traumatic uh, effect is still uh, being experienced in, in the town of, of Beira in Mozambique. And um, uh, only a few weeks after he died, uh, another uh, powerful cyclone, uh, Kennedy, also hit Mozambique um, in, in the central, the northern part of Mozambique, mainly in the town of uh, Pemba, having almost the same results. Although uh, uh, only, only, um, I mean, less people, I mean, died. Forty-five people um, died in 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 Capital Gado province um, because of cyclone he died. I mean, Kennedy. But after that, I mean, also, uh, also, uh, many other um, cyclonic events have uh, hit Mozambique and continue to hit Mozambique, uh, um, and clearly showing that um, we are living in a moment of uh, of um, uh, disasters uh, and, and um, uh, related to to climate change and particular uh, uh, cyclonic uh, extreme cyclonic events. So, uh, in in order to understand uh, that, I mean, to address that question, I also had some sub, I was also interested in understanding some other things, like, for example, I, I wanted to understand how domestic and international pressure for climate just influence uh, responses from society, uh, responses to, uh, like I said, cyclonic climate shocks, um, uh, taking into example a cyclone Idai and uh, what uh, the, the risks that Mozambique is facing with uh, concerning um, uh, the environment, and um, uh, also how the central, the local state and progressive movement organizations in the country perceive climate crisis. And more importantly, I wanted to um, use the example of Mozambique uh, in, uh, just to understand uh, if these, uh, uh, what the responses to it I, can inform changes to uh, Marx's ecological theory. Maybe let me jump into into that. Um, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, some of most of us uh, are already familiar with the Marx theory of the metabolic rift, which um, states that um, uh, um, uh, um, capitalist agriculture uh, results in a, a rift uh, between uh, uh, um, uh, 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 man and uh, in, in nature because it disrupts uh, um, the metabolic uh, 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 relation between uh, these two. Uh, so this is this is what Marx uh, states in, in its or, or original original form uh, of the theory. Um, and also that um, you know we need a society of um, independent uh, producers and not linked to market uh, to in order to fix uh, uh, this rift. But um, um, as you also may understand that um, 
it, for 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 me to be able to locate uh, i mean uh, max metabolic rift into the responses that are taking place now um from uh, um, uh, um, progressive forces of society but also including states i had to locate that theory or uh, expand my max um, metabolic rift from agriculture into the capitalist system in general so that i would come up with a, a climate a metabolic rift uh, theory so in in the sense this is to say that uh, not only agriculture industrial agriculture causes rift but climate uh, uh, capitalism as a system causes that that rift, but probably because uh, in Marx uh, uh, times, um, uh, you know, um, uh, either Marx didn't see that or it did not uh, the dimension of responses to from society to catastrophe or to disasters or even to let me not say to disaster to the disruption of of nature uh, by man. Uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it was not taken into, in, into account in, in, in Marx's ecological, ecological, ecological theory. Um, so this uh, gives an impression, uh, an, an idea that uh, societies do not respond to, to the metabolic rift that um, uh, uh, humans caused, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, to nature, which um, is hard to, to believe. But even if you, if we look, for example, at other uh, contemporaries of Marx, like Karl um, Fraz, Fraz built his, his theory of uh, catastrophe based on his analysis of the relationship between uh, 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 men or humans and the local climate. So it shows that at least uh, during the Marx period, some scholars were concerned already about this relationship. But there is also another element um, that we can uh, uh, hear uh, uh, mentioned, for example, brought by uh, Karl Polanyi. Polanyi talks about counter movement, uh, saying uh, which meaning basically that um, uh, there is a constant response respond from response from society uh, 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 to the uh, to market economy. So um, this uh, makes me believe that there there has to be some form of re of response. So which uh, Marx theory of metabolic rift uh, does not really. Uh, take into account. So there, there is some sort of what I would call here transformative counter movement that emerges from uh, from from uh, from uh, societies when they are confronted with crisis. We're talking about uh, Fariel was talking about water and uh, 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 and also mentioning some 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 forms of form of responses because societies end up responding to to uh, uh, threats of imminent collapse. So. I took the example of Mozambique because of Cyclone Idai, as we, as I, as I mentioned here, but also because Mozambique is a particular type of, of state, is what I would call here a weak, uh, I prefer to label in my research, a weak carbon democracy. A weak carbon democracy in the sense of uh, a kind of a democracy, not necessarily democracy, uh, fully fledged democracy, but meaning a country in which uh, democratic practices, um, which also emerge from the process of carbon extraction, transportation, and uh, and, and production, uh, and processing. Uh, sorry, um, these uh, democratic practices practices are actually uh, subject to uh, tight control of the ruling elite, uh, and trying to uh, actually favor more uh, the the interest of the of the of the extractivist uh, 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 corporate uh, corporation. So that's what I, I, I prefer to label Mozambique um, a weak carbon democracy. So in terms of method, I used a Michael Mark, Michael Budeau's extended case method, uh, as uh, maybe some of you um, might have come across uh, with this um, methodology method. Sorry, um, Budeau's extended case method is based on uh, ethnography, and um, the idea is to expand from one single case, uh, so to be able to uh, uh, expand from from micro uh, into my, uh, macro so it's a method um uh, uh, used for theory uh, reconstruction uh, bureau is, is some other scholars uh, which i i endorsed um, believe that um i mean a failure from a particular th theory to explain a particular phenomenon should not be used um, as a as a, a reason uh, to abandon a, a particular theory, but rather to, to strengthen uh, uh, that that theory. So that's why I, I used uh, this method because my idea was to actually reconstruct Marx's um, ecological uh, theory. Um, as I say, uh, as I might not have said, but uh, 
uh, not necessarily by rejecting it completely because uh, Max metabolic rift theory uh, uh, you know allows us to locate perfectly uh, uh, the relationship between men uh, and, and and nature and uh, and more importantly capitalism and nature. Uh, but obviously, it doesn't allow us to understand the agency of uh, of the state and and also of uh, some progressive forces when this relationship is is threatened by 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 capitalism. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, uh, results, uh, basically, I found um, I would say just in general, I found two types of um, responses. Um, uh, uh, at two, uh, at, uh, I mean, uh, I, I looked at three levels of responses. I looked at the national state, and um, I looked at the local state. And uh, when I, by local state, I mean the municipality uh, of of Beira, where I had to spend some time there uh, watching them responding to to this um, to the effects of to the shocks of uh, of climate. Uh, I mean, of cyclone Idai. So uh, I will. Just mention some briefly some uh, type of responses that identify identified from at the central level of, of the government, but also at the local level. But I will focus later on. I think which is more important to look at those that I think uh, I, I, we should call transformative responses that come from progressive forces on the ground. Um, in terms of the the central government, um, their responses, the central and local government. The responses were uh, mostly humanitarian, um, sort of just trying to respond to to the disaster by providing people with uh, water, providing with uh, I mean uh, reconstruction uh, measures and so on and so on. But there were also some political responses uh, and administrative responses. That's uh, what I label, which have to do with uh, the functioning of the state this, and, and the government. For example moving the cabinet meetings um, uh, from Maputo for the very first time ever, uh, uh, the cabinet meet meetings were moved to, to Beira to, uh, for the government to, I mean, um, of Mozambique to uh, 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 coordinate uh, better the responses uh, to the cyclone. But there were also some uh, legal and administrative responses, for example, putting in place uh, measures to exempt um, local businesses from uh, Having to pay on uh, reconstruction uh, uh, taxes for reconstruction, uh, rebuilding materials, um, and so on, so on. Uh, the municipality of of, of Beira engaged in uh, uh, major humanitarian measures as well uh, uh, to save the, the 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 victims victims of the cyclone, uh, cleaning uh, the the town of Beira to allow for for the humanitarian uh, uh, I mean uh, convoys to enter. Uh, beta and so on, so on, putting in place um, a municip municipal recovery and resilience uh, plan, which was for the first for the first time. So a plan that uh, uh, I mean speaks to rebuilding the town, taking into account uh, uh, issues of resilience. Um, the, both uh, the municipality of Beira and um, uh, the central government of Mozambique held together an, an international co conference uh, to uh, pledge for uh, uh, um, donors to support um, uh, reconstruction of uh, uh, of beta and which led to um, a, a, spe a specific cabinet cabinet uh, sorry a office uh, or a office for reconstruction of uh, of uh, of um, post they call it post cyclone edi reconstruction office that was put in place with a mandate of uh, five years and beyond to um, assist uh, rebuilding uh, uh, the town the town of uh, the, the, the town of Beira but it's, as I told you after he died another cyclone hit in uh, 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 Mozambique uh, also another very extreme cyclone uh, Kennedy so the, the mandate of the office um, was then uh, uh, expanded to not only he died but to uh, uh, Kenneth um, as well, but there was another, another very important measure at the at the level of central government, which was the transformation of the office um, or of uh, disaster uh, uh, management to the office of risk uh, uh, prevention. So, um, I mean, pointing exactly that uh, Idai uh, led 
Mozambique into changing its approach to a, a, a disaster from disaster management to risk uh, uh, prevention. And but now what we have to to see it's uh, it's how far this risk prevention um, measures um, involve Mozambique's relationship to uh, the entire process of extractivism, which uh, I mean Mozambique is becoming a, a, an economy. A, a, a centralized in extractivism being the extractive uh, extractivist uh, industry uh, uh, one of the main sources of the of Mozambique uh, state's revenues so it's important to see in future uh, if uh, Idai would have brought up also those changes so those are the, the kind of changes that uh, I mean responses that I I uh, managed to identify at the uh, uh, national level and state level and also at the local level of the municipality now going to um a progressive um a, a social movement responses i looked at three uh, a, 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 a social movement organizations in mozambique i looked at the national union of small scale farmers of mozambique which is the largest uh, uh, peasant organization in, in the country one of the largest in the region uh, uh, UNAC, um, and I also looked at uh, Justice Ambiental, which is an an NGO uh, in Mozambique uh, that I mean the most vocal NGO in Mozambique fighting for for climate justice, and I also looked at the uh, uh, ADECRU, which is a youth um, uh, organization uh, uh, in Mozambique. Uh, all these organizations are also linked to. Uh, um, uh, other big platform pl platforms uh, globally, like for example, the UNAC is uh, uh, um, the first member of La Via Campesina uh, uh, on the African on the African continent, um, and, and it remains the only member of La Via Campesina in, in Mozambique. Uh, Justice Ambiental is one of the most active members of uh, Friends of the Earth International, and Adia Crew is a very 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 uh, close. Uh, um, Organization to the uh, Movimento dos Trabalhadores uh, Sem Terra uh, in Brazil, MST. So um, I looked at what this, I tried to, to, to understand what these organizations did uh, uh, um, in response to Cyclone, Cyclone Idai, uh, in, in order to understand how uh, progressive movements are responding to, 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 to uh, the threats of collapse in the context of. Uh, anthropogenic climate climate change. So here, just um, uh, to summarize, I found two types of responses. The, to some extent, they were humanitarian responses. Uh, they worked in trying to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, pledge for solidarity uh, locally, uh, but also internationally. Uh, for example, in their own, inside their own movements, they collected um, uh, non-perishable material uh, to uh, to be shared, to be distributed to uh, humanitarian organizations that were sending products to um, uh, to the vic victims of the cyclone. So they were also requesting solidarity from other uh, 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 sister organizations. Uh, uh, globally, some other others from Germany, and so and so on. They were also providing medical, 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 psychological, and also reconstruction uh, uh, support um, on the ground. And they were also, um, I mean, serving as bridge for uh, those organizations outside Mozambique that wanted to send support. Um, to some humanitarian organizations on the ground, but they did not have any, any contacts in Mozambique. So for example, Justice Ambiental would serve as a, as a bridge to then allocate a, 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 a support to a, 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 some humanitarian NGOs a, a, on the ground. But uh, more important than that, I found that these organizations also, and in particular, uh, UNAC also used um, a food sovereignty has, has, and more precisely, agroecology technique has a response to catastrophe or to disaster. 
uh, in the sense that they organized, uh, uh, I mean, uh, small gardens uh, 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 in local to produce uh, food um, post Idai using agroecological uh, techniques, but also discussing the, all the uh, political conceptualization of uh, uh, um, of uh, uh, um, uh, food uh, 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 um, agroecology, obviously everything framed in 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 the principle of, of food sovereignty. So we can see here a transformative way of response that speaks to I mean uh, uh, local markets speaks to a relationship with uh, nature that links to what Max uh, says uh, when he speaks about associated producers uh, um, um, and so on and so on, but con counteracting uh, capitalism as well. So food, the agroecology use, being used as, uh, as a, a, a form of response to uh, uh, anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic uh, climate change um, uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, they also used um, this in in their trainings and also in their uh, in the, in their platforms, um, social media platform, their interaction with the outside world. They also used this example of cyclone Idai as a clear example of anthropogenic climate change and the Apologies, need. Apologies, um, yes. I must interrupt, but we have gone over oh. time, and I must go now okay. to the next speaker. Okay. Um, apologies for that, but I think that these okay. next points we can pick them up in the discussion. Yeah. Um, okay. So please do not lose them uh, for everyone who's listening, also, because I'm sure that they would like to go into them. Um, okay. Our next speaker is Professor Patrick Bond, who will be speaking on disaster management through imperial or the sub imperial lens. Uh, Patrick Bond is a political economist based at the University of Johannesburg, where he's a distinguished professor of sociology and the director of the Center for Social Change. His doctoral studies were at John Hopkins University under David Harvey's supervision in 1994 to 1996. And he worked in the Reconstruction and Development Ministry within President Nelson Mandela's office, drafting the Democratic government's first white paper and other policies. His best known work is the lead transition from apartheid, <coughs> excuse me, from apartheid to neoliberalism in South Africa, but he has written or edited a half dozen books on the economy, environment, and public policy, including politics of climate justice, parasites above, movement below. Um, thank you, Patrick. You may go and you're ready. Uh, you have 15 oh, minutes. Oh, thanks very much, Comrade Wanda, and uh, warm greetings to everybody there. I think this group um, that uh, has been doing emancipatory futures is formidable and often at the very cutting edge, especially of, of anti-imperialist and anti-sub-imperialist politics when it comes to climate and um, environmental justice. And we really need it, don't we, with our neighbors like uh, Mozambique, the uh, fourth, uh, fifth hardest hit country because of the situation that we've just heard from Fredson, um, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, Kenya. And uh, from the 2020s, we're going to see many more as, as the heating intensifies, the droughts, the floods. The problem is that there's one African member of the group that's mainly responsible for causing climate disasters. That's South Africa. The group, meaning the G20 of imperialist and sub-imperialist forces generally in alliance. Now, the African Union has just joined in the India meeting of the G20. I don't think that means much. The African Union is often described, I'll quote uh, the Zimbabwean former finance minister, Tendai Biti, as a trade union of dictators. And I don't think we'll see any progress from the G20 expanding, but it will be hosted in Rio in November by our dear comrades who are there, hopefully listening in from Brazil and uh, working with the local activists. And we will be hosting in South Africa under President uh, Ramaphosa, or maybe President Mashatile, the G20 Imperial Sub-Imperial Alliance meeting here in 2025. What we know from these sorts of meetings is that South Africa is a very good um, sub-imperial ally for multilateral imperialism applied to climate and uh, other ecological disasters. Certainly 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development was exemplary for leaving out climate. And then probably as uh, Kofi Annan was uh, desperate because George W. Bush at the time was defunding the UN, this multilateral situation required 
corporates to become more involved in South African corporates are part and parcel of the problem. We saw that again in 2009, didn't we? This was the famous photograph from the Copenhagen United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the COP15, when um, in a, a very, uh, let's say, extreme move, Barack Obama learned where four leaders from the basic country, Brazil, South Africa, India, China, were meeting, those being Lula at the time and still, again, President uh, Jacob Zuma uh, and uh, Manmohan Singh and Wen Jibao. And Obama just marched in because the uh, NSA told him which of the secret green rooms these guys were meeting in. And then they did the Copenhagen Accord, which was um, the uh, bottom up, as they put it in their Orwellian way, a mode of saying, uh, you pollute, we pollute. And of course, the groups, uh, uh, the group there was amongst the, the, the main historical polluters. Crucial to this argument is we will continue to pollute. We won't cut the emissions to the extent we need to, to prevent planetary arson. And also, we will never admit liability. And when one African uh, leader at that meeting, uh, Lumumba Diaping, the Sudanese ambassador to the UN and head of the G77 delegation, described how disappointed he was in a civil society briefing that many of the negotiating delegations from Africa were unprepared or had been bought off, but he specifically singled out South Africa because members of that delegation had actively sought to disrupt the unity of the bloc when he was doing very strong advocacy against the the Copenhagen Accord that came out. So because of that success in fusing imperial, sub-imperial um, uh, interests in uh, climate non-mitigation and, and non-liability, South Africa was chose, uh, chosen to host the COP17. And again, we saw very much in person in Durban where this was held, the um, coalition of states, including the big polluter nations from the south, South Africa, the third highest in the world per person per unit of output in terms of emissions, um, aligning with big oil, big coal, big gas, big nukes, um, and, and the West, and uh, against the climate justice agenda. That was confirmed again in Paris at the, at the COP21 when the um, voluntary characteristics of these climate negotiations were confirmed and again written very explicitly into the COP um, 17, the or COP 21 Paris climate agreement was that there will be no liability for climate debt. Now, this begins to get personal, doesn't it? Um, in Durban 2022, the rain bomb that killed an estimated 500, some of the bodies still haven't been located, missing people, still number in the dozens. But um, we know that uh, when 200, uh, 351 millimeters hit within 24 hours. It was a world story. And even President Ramaphosa came and said, look, this disaster is part of climate change. It's telling us it's serious uh, and um, it is here. We no longer can postpone what we need to do and the measures we need to take to deal with climate change. Now, Ramaphosa had done that exact speech in 2019 at the prior uh, rain bomb that hit uh, Durban at that point, only 168 millimeters, but 97 dead. That was in um, 2019. And I'm sure Vishwas with his photo essays will be providing much more of these sorts of signs. It wasn't just the poor, all it was um, only three wealthy white people were killed among the 500. Um, here you see Mshloti where white people living in vacation homes in the nicest part of that beach were also affected and industry was affected. Look at the way these containers just get crumpled or knocked over by the intense storm that happened April 12, 2022. And the huge, um, let's uh, call it the, the single worst site of, um, of, uh, of climate uh, uh, damage done by oil refineries on the whole continent until this point at which SAPREF was closed down, nearby engine had been closed down due, an due to an explosion in late 2020. Um, now, we learn a lot by seeing what has been loss and damage. The politics of loss and damage here is very revealing because um, the one company that really has benefited from a massive upgrade of stormwater drainage and pumping systems was Toyota because of um, their losing several tens of thousands of automobiles due to mud damage because the Isipingo River overflowed. To prevent the flight of industries from the South Durban Basin, the Etiquini municipality has announced 235 million rand in infrastructure upgrades. And um, it's these losses that have 
prompted the insurance industry to question the insurability of companies situated within the South Urban Basin for a multinational. It means the other facilities around the world would need to share the risk of these South African-based companies, and this increase in risk would reduce their company value and associated share price. And hence, to be a loyal sub-imperialist to international capital, that's where the money went, not to the um, sewage system, which of course has been very, very notorious. The city of Durban continually facing malfunctioning pumps and disasters where E. coli counts hit North Beach, the most democratic place in, in South Africa. Um, and that's where uh, beaches are regularly closed. And even the houses where uh, 12,000 houses were, were wrecked, uh, the flood victims have been unable to get um, loss and damage relief. So that just gives you a little picture of the extreme ways in which a sub-imperial agenda continues several traditions locally, including super exploitation, destruction of local poor and working class people's um, uh, ecologies and their lives indeed. Um, and I think this is fairly characteristic of the BRICS because this is a very important time when our, for example, our, our friends and comrades at the Tricontinental Institute have just put out their hyper-imperialism thesis. They simply won't deal with the way, as I put it already, a sub-imperial imperial relationship exists. Now, what is this term that I've been using? It's basically, as Joy Mauro Marini, who coined it, uh, puts it, the collaboration uh, within imperialist expansion. Now, because of capitalist crises, overproduction, overaccumulation, capital always needs to penetrate and expand and commodify everything. BRICS countries and companies are part of this. They in, are engaged, as Marini explained, in super exploitation within the local economy. And as they reach stages of monopolies and finance capital, they have to go out, as uh, the Chinese call their expansion, the Belt and Road Initiative. And that um, sometimes entails inter-imperial and inter-sub-imperial rivalries and antagonistic cooperation. The dilemma after Marini coined that to describe Brazil in the 60s and early 70s is that it became supercharged in the 2000s, not simply hyper-imperialism that the Tricontinental Institute um, has, I think, effectively described, especially in military terms. They don't deal so much with the overall dilemma, which is uh, the problem of the overaccumulation of capital at the global scale. The volatility of international capitalism has called forth, as David Harvey put it, a series of temporary spatio-temporal fixes. You move the problem around geographically and you move it through time using credit, but they fail. And what he noticed, especially um, coming up through the crises of the 2000s, the big uh, financial co collapse of 2008, where the G20 was revitalized and um, uh, the Southern uh, savings, especially pools of money from East Asia, from uh, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, that became the site where sub-imperialisms arose. Each developing center of capital accumulation sought it out its own system, systematic spatio-temporal fixes for its own surplus capital by defining its territorial spheres of influence. Now, that sometimes goes too far, as we've seen with rogue sub-imperialists like Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine. Um, the Israelis are not rogue so much as we expect them to do expansions and, and occupations of the West Bank because they're encouraged by U.S. imperialism, but it really is rogue in the sense it's so out of control now, even the U.S. is voting sort of vaguely against them in the Security Council uh, last Friday. As for the BRICS, um, they may come up as anti-imperial in rhetoric, and they certainly would reject the continuous interventions, including preemptive wars, as Samir explain, uh, Amin explained. They reject the geopolitics of imperialism, but they accept economic neoliberalism. And South Africa's uh, one of the worst at this, and you can trace this as, as Samir has done um, before he passed in 2018 to the 1970s, where parallel to his friend Marini's uh, exploration of Brazil, where um, motor cars, electronics, and pharmaceuticals rose, the thesis of sub-imperialism was to some extent an expansion of phenomena that in Africa take the form of South Africa um, and uh, its trade relations in Southern Africa. Now, after apartheid ended, we should have uh, seen that uh, change, but he traced the, the continuities between South Africa's internal colonialism, which still exists in the sense of migrant labor and therefore super exploitation gendered, of course, because men are often the ones doing the, the travel, women staying home and, and reproducing the cheap labor. Luxury goods bias and import and capitalism's regional geographic displacement tendency. So in 2019, his 
posthumous autobiography describes South Africa in these terms, nothing has changed. South Africa's sub-imperialist role has been reinforced, still dominated as it is by the Anglo-American mining monopolies. Again, I would challenge dear comrades in the Tricontinental Institute and the so-called campus network of those supporting the BRICS as anti-imperial to quickly look at the work of Samir Amin um, on this. Now, Sam Moyo and, and um, Parish Uris have described these characteristics of sub-imperialism that are important. And I think the most important is that there's a degree of participation in the Western military project that reflects one might say a schizophrenia to all this typical of sub-imperialism. So for example, Brazil's Lula and Haiti, Russia's desire to join NATO, yes, to join NATO, um, the Wagner mercenaries role in the resource extractivism in Africa, especially in Central African Republic and the, and the Sahel, India joining the Quad against China. Now, here we come to the most important point, one I'm sure that's Fredson's next chapter in the thesis I hope he can present another time, which is South Africa's army deployment to protect blood methane investments by Total, ExxonMobil, and China National Petroleum in northern Mozambique against the Islamic insurgency. And then last month, a 3,000 troop deployment um, in the Eastern DRC to replace MONUSCO, reminding us of the Central African Republic in 2013. That um, Eastern DRC is a very hot topic because the Rwandan-backed M23 are coming up. And I don't know, frankly, where we should be positioning ourselves in solidarity with Congolese comrades who obviously don't want to see the Eastern uh, DRC overrun by M23. But what we did see 10 days ago at the Cape Town March was a very clear statement against multinational corporates who are driving this process. And those include South African and a whole variety, which we can get into if anybody wants. But I would still say that since we are celebrating the anti-imperialism of Naledi Pandor in going to the International Court of Justice against um, Israeli uh, genocide in, in Gaza, we should be aware that she's also participating in genocide on the other side on behalf of the search for energy, the desire of South Africa to import natural gas from Mozambique and to use South Africa's security agencies. This was her testimony in 2020. It's really appalling that the dialectic we have to work with, the anti-imperialism of the South African regime against the axis of genocide, Tel Aviv, Washington, um, uh, Berlin, uh, London, uh, Amsterdam, Ottawa, um, on the one hand, but South Africa's very active prosecution of um, especially it's uh, it's okay after the Wagner group was was kicked out the Dyke advisory group from South Africa mercenaries the paramount group by the Zionist extremist Ivor Chikovitz who's the last uh, couple of months been lobbying very heavily against um, ANC um, support for um, Palestinians uh, unsuccessfully obviously but he was the number one uh, donor on record his family foundation to the ANC last year as the uh, public disclosures uh, confirm. But these are the sorts of attacks, and, and South Africa is losing this war. The guerrillas uh, fighting the Rwandan army and others in the Sadek and Samim South African uh, mission in Mozambique mission. And we can see why it's happening. And I, I know Fredson knows this intimately, that Emmanuel Macron had twisted um, Ramaphosa's arm and said, look, uh, we'll you know maybe play with you on the COVID-19 vaccine IP uh, waiver, but you're going to have to put your troops in there to protect us. And this is what South Africa wanted to do. France stands ready to offer naval assistance that you use there. Uh, to uh, provide backup. Even AFRICOM, the US imperialists and Pentagon are very much involved. So I do think the no to gas in Mozambique is, again, then Fredson's next chapter of his, of his thesis, describing the resistance to the gas. And of course, we've been doing this. Oh, there's somebody from uh, a couple of people from the CJCM movement linking IACOT, the East African crude oil pipeline, Somkele, the coal mine here where Vikile and Chingasi was was assassinated and Capital Gato, all financed by Standard Bank, where we go regularly to say, get the hell out of um, the blood methane financing. Um, now, this is the sort of thing that we're particularly worried about. One of the bricks, and I'll just come back to finish if I still have a couple of minutes. I wonder you have to keep me uh, honest here in my 15 minutes. But if you go through all of the high carbon, high capital intensive and high corruption, seriously high corruption activities of China, all throughout this, you see them in Capital Gado, you see them in crude oil in Tanzania. So there is something about South Africa playing a sub-imperial 
alliance with the Chinese in these war zones. Now it gets worse because the BRICS have just added five new members. They tried to add Argentina. Argentina turned far to the right and turned out, we, we haven't yet heard finally from Saudi Arabia, but look at this very high carbon block that's just coming in. And, and especially in Kazan in October, when uh, Vladimir Putin hosts the BRICS, there will be even more of these high carb uh, a tyrant, a tyrannies. And some of them, even though they have less than 29% of GDP, they represent 43% of world oil production and 51% of annual megatons of CO2 emissions. So when one of the brand new BRICS has just hosted the COP28, you have no uh, surprise that it's a, an oil man, who, you know, uh, Sultan al Jaber, head of the uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil Corporation, who was doing all sorts of new oil deals at the time. He was supposedly uh, trying to help uh, prevent planetary arson. And that job has been handed for Azerbaijan to another oil man because Vladimir Putin wanted uh, this man to be the host. Now, we don't see too much out of these. So just one last uh, glimpse at the sub-imperial imperial relationship in creating a catastrophe. We're supposedly going to have a, a just energy transition partnership here in South Africa. And it was done at this meeting in uh, uh, 2022 in Glasgow. And you can see all the people coming into the um, uh, meeting there, which was actually, this was uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, where they finally sealed the deal and South Africa doing a deal to get 8.5 billion, actually in nearly entirely loans, 97% plus um, mostly market rate from the US and UK and all sorts of other side deals like Olaf Scholz wanting to have more coal exports from South Africa. There's no consultation on this just energy transition partnership. Sorry, Patrick. I Unfortunately, we have gone over time. Um, okay, so let me just wrap up. I'll have to cut you there. That's just fine. But the um, last slide, the last slide is to celebrate CJCM being the sole group to say we should be doing a boycott of these kinds of nonsensical deals. So more power to you. I just hope you are consistent with the rhetoric and don't just uh, talk green, um, but but walk that walk and, and let's get uh, climate sanctions going, a carbon border adjustment mechanism and more uh, pressure on the sub-imperial regime in Pretoria and the high carbon uh, corporates that it represents. Thanks, dear comrades. Thank you very much. And I think that hopefully we'll be able to keep these points to carry on into our conversation. I think we've now created a thread from water disasters to the cyclones and now to this sub-imperial, imperial lens. And this then brings me to our final speaker, Dr. Vishwa Sadka, uh, who will be speaking on facing the heat uh, in South Africa, a photographic essay on climate shocks. Uh, Dr. Vishwa Sadka is an Associate Professor of International Relations, Editor of the Democratic Marxism Series, and Principal Investigator for Emancipatory Future Studies at Fitz University, South Africa. He's also a veteran activist and co-founder of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and the Climate Justice Charter Movement. Um, Vish, you may go when you're ready. Yes, uh, thanks, Awande. So... I'm going to speak to a photographic essay um, that I've been kind of developing since 2015 around climate extremes and shocks. But let me start by saying that there's no such a thing as uh, natural disasters. Uh, David Harvey makes this point very, very strongly. Uh, disasters become disasters because ruling elites and classes and actually society also fails uh, to protect itself. Uh, we are living in an epoch of unnatural uh, global disasters. Um, we are living through the fourth great crisis of capitalism. It's a crisis that affects everything. Uh, the background conditions of capitalism, the foreground conditions of capitalism. And it's, a, and it's a context in which you can see very, very clearly that ruling elites are coming short. They don't have answers to the systemic dynamics driving this crisis in the world system. I think the other point to make is that underlying all of this, and maybe to kind of pull through a thread from Ferriol's talk, what's driving this fourth great crisis and, and actually a clash between the world system and the earth system is what I would call accumulation through ecocide. In other words, it's a system that's eating up the ecological and material basis of its own existence. You're seeing this reflected in the climate crisis and increasing rates of emissions. Uh, you're seeing it reflected in biodiversity loss, soil depletion, 
uh, overshoots of planetary boundaries, etc. So this clash between the world system and the Earth system is very much defining this epoch of unnatural disasters. Uh, I'm just going to, again, go back to my, 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 my South African case study to illustrate how these unnatural climate disasters are beginning to intensify and ramify uh, more and more into socio-ecological reality. I've been, as I said, doing this since 2015, recognizing that um, it's now live reality in everyday life, climate extremes, and we really, really need to kind of go into this front line uh, to learn, to understand, uh, and to bring that to the fore. So I think, uh, I wonder you can see my slides here. Um, so this is, as I said, a larger project. The first theme in this project deals with the making of fossil fuel power. I don't have time to share those slides with you. Uh, I've been to coal pits and um, Petro SA, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of look at the background conditions of uh, fossil fuels in South Africa. I also have a theme around fossil fuels in the everyday because what I found is as these shocks have been ramifying, most of us in society continue the normality of, of society, but yet there's something ominous uh, in the background. There's something ominous even in our lives uh, that's unfolding. This is the third theme. And then of course, there's a fourth theme around climate um, justice. So governance droughts is where I'm going to start. And day zero clearly marked our national consciousness. And what was clear during day zero is that many, many people rallied around the natural commons and water springs to basically meet their water needs. The city of Cape Town did not prepare for this drought despite climate science and various warnings. Um, and, it, and essentially it pushed the crisis onto people. Uh, its day zero approach was punitive uh, in it basically managing it on the demand side and forcing people to find outlets and exits to survive. The rich, of course, uh, dropped down boreholes. There were over 26,000 boreholes uh, that uh, households uh, put into place, mainly rich, affluent households in Cape Town to meet their needs. In early 2019, I decided to kind of try to figure out why the city of Cape Town was relaxing its restrictions and, but of course, still managing the demand side. And uh, basically, I went to Theavatus Kloof Dam, which is one of the big uh, feeder dams. And again, its levels were pretty low. Uh, this is Century City on the left. And again, it's a kind of elite enclave, uh, abundant water, et cetera, and so on and so on. So there was something going on around the sort of day zero story uh, in Cape Town. Those who had money and wealth uh, were fine. And those who didn't were actually carrying the cost, injustice of the day zero moment. But I also went beyond the Cape Town headlines to try and understand what was happening in smaller towns and cities. Uh, was this just a Cape Town story? And it wasn't. The drought was impacting various small towns and cities, uh, particularly in the Southern and Western Cape. Um, and many, many cities were, were, and towns were faced with water constraints. Um, this is in Franschhoek again, the, the Berg River Dam, also not very full. Uh, this was around 2019 at the tail end of things. But again, farmers were still using the commons to, to meet their needs. Ordinary citizens, people were also using the, the commons to meet their needs. Uh, this is Lanesburg, again, a small town uh, having serious water challenges. Uh, this was Prince Albert. And again, you can see those who control water, like 62% of water allocation um, to farming in South Africa, still use water despite restrictions and so on. Uh, of course, there's a disconnect between political parties and the fact that we were living one of the worst droughts in the history of, of the country. They were more interested in fighting each other than foregrounding the, the drought. Uh, animals also took a toll uh, around the drought, and one of the, the sort of stories I pursued was the fact that horses and donkeys were, were literally released by farmers because they couldn't afford to buy more feed, etc. Many of them were emaciated, were struggling to survive, and so I followed the story of donkeys and went to a donkey refuge uh, that was actually trying to 
gather these donkeys uh, in the Karoo area and, and wider fields and give them a safe uh, place to live. Uh, this was craft Renette, bone dry the dam um, and 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 basically water restrictions. And in most parts of the sort of racial geography of the town, people didn't have water in poorer, particularly black uh, communities. Uh, this is Sutherland and again, uh, hit very hard by the drought. And uh, these are farm workers that lost their jobs. Again, the shifting of injustice was very, very visible to see. Um, this is the town of um, Grahamstown, and it has had a layered problem, and that's why I call it governance droughts, because, you know, you have hydrological droughts, you have agri ag agricultural droughts, um, but this has got to do with state failure in South Africa. And it became clear to me as I traveled through these day zero uh, towns and cities that the state was failing dramatically in South Africa, and I think that was Ferial's point as well. And here, as I said, you had a 10-year problem. In this town, they weren't even monitoring water supply or anything like that to households. And again, the water commons became very, very important for, for survival. This is the Bushman's River, completely dry in the Eastern Cape. And again, animals were being hit very hard. And I went to um, a conservation um, a hospital uh, to look at what was happening to, to animals, hippos, etc., all suffering from the lack of water. So again, uh, when we talk about ecocide, we're also talking about the impacts on non-human life. As capital continues using oil, coal, and gas, well, it's wiping out humans, but it's also wiping out non-human life forms. Nelson Mandela Bay has been on the radar and was kind of at the tail end of this drought, uh, the big city facing a water crisis. And again, I wanted to get into the back end of the story. I went to all the main feeder dams, uh, all of them very low. You could see there wasn't adequate planning uh, for this. Um, there's definitely a link to uh, a bigger dam, the Kharib Dam in the Free State, but big issues around infrastructure, big issues around channeling water, et cetera, came through. But what I also found was that the agricultural areas uh, around um, uh, Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, particularly in Bavianskloof, again, controlling a lot of water, uh, were flourishing. Uh, they, they were using that water to ensure they were able to export. But again, poorer uh, working class and, and, and township communities were facing very, very strict restrictions. And again, this fault line of, of inequality and injustice came through very, very strongly. But just to pause there and to say that, um, to come back to this idea of governance droughts and, and transformative responses, and to again pull through what Ferial is saying, if we do not tackle uh, the crisis of the local and the national state around water and water governance and democratize it, as she was arguing, around the water commons, we're going to have serious conflict in South Africa. Uh, as she underlined, we are walking into a nightmare. OK, and at the heart of this is a failing state and failing water systems and governance systems. The other thing I picked up uh, between 2019 and 2023 was flash floods, landslides, hail and wave surges and beach erosion. This is the town of Craddock. Uh, I was there while a storm was coming in and took this shot as I was exiting Craddock and it flooded in an instant. Uh, it was a flash storm. It was an extreme storm. The town wasn't ready for this. Um, the water just built up rapidly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another thing, thank you, Awande. Uh, another thing I did very quickly was, was follow weather patterns and reports. And this, again, was an extreme storm surge in the Southern Cape. And I went into the hinterland after that storm and saw lots of flooding on farms, et cetera. This was the big impact of the storm surge in Durban. Uh, because of time, I'm just racing through this, but you can see the power uh, of the Earth's response to more oil, coal, and gas use, uh, ripping through uh, sort of urban and, and spatial areas. Um, and then we've had storm surges uh, eroding uh, beaches, etc. Heats and wildfires are very real in South Africa now, uh, and so on. Um, and then, of course, we are having too much water inundation, and our water infrastructure is old. This farm lost more sheep because of too much water, uh, more sheep than during the drought in the Karoo, etc. 
uh, again, flooding in uh, um, uh, Moy River, uh, and this was sort of uh, the, the sort of uh, low point of all of this, a school completely flooded out. Uh, we are releasing water uh, from our dams, and this is flooding downstream. Um, this is Lutzville, the community cut off one of the roads um, because of too much water, uh, and so on and so on. To conclude, we need climate justice. But again, just to underline, I mean, our transformative responses can be immediate. Uh, we need to understand the complexity of these shocks, uh, like, like in Durban. Yes, water came and too much of it came, but landslides also came. Uh, and uh, infrastructure wasn't ready uh, and crumbled pretty fast. Uh, there's a whole lot to think about this with storm surges. We really got to think about spatial planning, early warning systems, et cetera. But most importantly, we need to place the country on a climate emergency footing. And that's what the Climate Justice Charter movement is fighting for. Thanks for your time. Thanks. I wonder, I hope I'm okay on time. I wonder. Hello? Hello? I can hear you, Vish. I think Awande is slowing down. There you go. Okay, Awande, you okay? Sorry, my computer froze. Um, but we're, 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 we're good. Thank you. You actually were ahead of time, uh, which <laughs> gives us more time for discussion also. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> um, I think, thank you to all our speakers once again. The presentations really drew a nice thread from beginning with the water issue, delving into the cyclones and the disasters in the Mozambican case to the imperial and sub-imperial lens, and then back to this photographic essay, which also has really shown a great picture of what systemic and government failure and bring home the perspective with regards to the fact that uh, these disasters are not natural, but they're planned. And I think that Every presentation has done really well in taking us through the various scales um, of how that looks and the ways in which that presents, which then now brings us to discussion. We have 40 minutes left for discussion. So if anyone would like to ask our speakers with regards to maybe points that were brought up within their presentation or things that speakers did not have time to elaborate on, uh, now would be a great time, so you can just write your questions into the chat. Um, I see that there was an earlier question. I don't know if they got picked up, but I'll begin with that question, uh, giving others more time then to also formulate theirs for the speakers. It's from uh, Jose Correra, uh, who asked uh, Fredson with regards to Fredson's presentation, uh, saying, very informative, uh, what are static government and others doing to make the most of rainwater harvesting. Are there any projects catalyzing now on the rain season and saving water for dry season? Jose Carrera from Mozambique. Uh, Fredson, would you be able to take that? Hello, um, thank you. Thank you, Ivo, for your question. Uh, well, I, my research doesn't really focus on, uh, on that, uh, but what I know is that SADC, um, at least in 2016, used to have a regional water strategy uh, that you know was supposed to, and it, it, it's probably it might have uh, another one running now, which was supposed to govern relationships. Uh, 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 I mean, in regarding water management in the region, uh, and also emphasizing the need for Southern countries to, I mean, develop a partnership for for support in terms of water management. Let's say water management, and also. Uh, rescue initiatives like based on what South Africa uh, used to do in the past to Mozambique, going there and help uh, the Mozambican people in terms of flooding and so on and so on, which they also did. Uh, South Africa was the first one to have arrived in Mozambique and uh, and saved um, victims of uh, the, the cyclone Idai. Uh, I mean, also due to limited capacity of the Mozambican government. But I don't really know much about the any projects regarding harvesting and so on and so on. But I know there has been some uh, cooperation between uh, South Africa and Mozambique in, 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 term, in terms of uh, when, when disasters strike. And uh, during Cyclone Idai, as I was saying, um, um, South Africa also was the first one to have arrived and to have saved uh, Mozambican, uh, Mozambican people from, uh, from, from the floods, yeah. 
Thank you. Sorry, I, I also forgot, if you do have a question, you may raise your hand uh, and we can also give you uh, functionality to speak also. Uh, Patrick has his hand up. It's really to follow up there because Fredson and also this this uh, new question about what is the optimal practical way. I think Fredson would uh, certainly agree that South Africa can do good. We certainly owe Mozambicans huge climate debt payments and putting our South African National Defense Force helicopters to rescue people instead of to um, shoot uh, local um, communities and, and the Islamic guerrilla movement in the north is appropriate. So I, I don't know if, if Fredson would agree, but when we evoke the climate debt South Africa owes, I think there, there are two or three things. One is this emergency response. Um, knowing the SANDF, and I think everybody in the house probably knows that there's a nickname which is Mabena, because they screw up and they're underfunded and they're uh, often useless. They, as we saw, they look like SADF 2.0 last year when they were burning bodies like at a bri, the old SADF did. So I wouldn't really, Fredson, want the um, SANDF to be the main face of South Africa when there are cyclones and other catastrophes of this sort. What about gift of the givers? And since we're, I think, all conscious of what um, Israel's doing by way of genocide, it is very important that Gift of the Givers is a vehicle that I think we all trust. I think the society understands it's an exceptionally good emergency charity vehicle when we can't trust the existing aid system in places like Gaza or, frankly, Mozambique. So certainly when Cyclone Freddy came last year, I saw lots of evidence of, of Gift of the Givers. But it is good for all of us, especially those of us who are who are carbon criminals like myself. I have... Uh, you know, a lot of air miles to 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 now work off at say three thousand dollars a ton, which is what some of my colleagues are are suggesting is the appropriate social cost of carbon, not the uh, thirty U.S. cents that the South African government charges, or the hundred and thirty-two dollars in Sweden, or the sixty-five dollars in the in the EU ETS. So I guess I'd ask everybody, how do you contemplate a country or an economy or corporates or climate uh, criminals like myself? paying our um, ecological debt? Would it be through basic income grants? Maybe Fredson, we could ask those areas hard hit by Soclan a day, Kenneth in the North, Freddie, should we be finding ways to fund them through a basic income grant, cash grant? Ochevera in Namibia is a good example. Should we also be doing as the last point, sorry to go on, but the last point is the one that South Africa benefited from. We should be paying Mozambique to leave its gas uh, under the Ravuma Basin. Um, to me, that would be, as South Africa's asked, for payments from the West, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, to not extract coal from uh, Maputa, from Mpumalanga. They very explicitly say that. Would that be one of the ways to begin to work off the climate debt that some of us owe, that the South African people owe, at least the 1% of the top who are the climate criminals, that they owe to uh, the Mozambicans. Let's let's think about disaster management that would be not just immediate response, but something structural, where those in the imperialist and sub-imperialist powers who've done so much to cause the problem now have to uh, support polluter pays, as it's called, polluter pays principles, and actually pay for the damage that we've been doing. I say that, by the way, from the global north here in Johannesburg. I actually, um, I think Patrick has done well to get us started on responding to uh, Dr. Troy Governor's question about these recommendations or solutions. So, Bretson, I'd like to give you the opportunity to respond to that question, um, taking uh, 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 Patrick's lead on what are some of the pragmatic recommendations or solutions for some of the critical issues that you raise in your presentation, and then I'll extend it to the rest of the panel, uh, uh, to Ferial and Vish also, but Fredson. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with Patrick about South Africa's sub-imperialist role in Mozambique, especially, I mean, through the, 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 the army and also through South African business. We have Sassel in Yamban, for example, depleting gas in Mozambique, destroying uh, uh, communities, creating more and more, um, uh, uh, I mean, pollution and, 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 and unemployment. And and so and so, but it it, did, it, it didn't start now. I mean, South African uh, South African economy, uh, even during apartheid, benefited uh, substantially from um, Mozambique's. Uh, I mean, I mean, cheap uh, cheap labor uh, uh, brought into the country uh, through forced labor and so on and so on. So there is a continuum uh, to that. Um, I mean, even prior to what we are looking at today, some imperialism. There also colonialism also played a role. Apartheid played a role in uh, in the South Africa versus Mozambique relationship. And today we see obviously 
to um, the role of South African South African Army uh, in in Cap Delgado, but also uh, to uh, um, uh, I mean South African South African um, extractive business like like Sasso and in 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 in, in Yambane, like I said. But I mean, we think I think uh, that in terms of what we should do, uh, I mean, or what we can do, and like I was trying to say in and, and Vish also mentioned the, about the word transformative responses, and we, this is what where I was heading to in my in my presentation. There has been some transformative responses from progressive forces on the ground, like by proposing um, uh, food sovereignty, climate justice, and so on, and so on. To, to fight disaster and uh, ultimately to fight uh, capitalism in general. So there are these initiatives happening on the ground through the examples that I mentioned here, but here in South Africa with obviously the full sovereignty, climate change, uh, climate charter and so on and so on, the works of other, uh, uh, many of the activists that are actually involved here in this discussion, for example. So at, at the level of society and societal actors and non-government actors or progressive forces, there's a lot being being done there, be, being put forward. Patrick showed clearly now interesting pictures of um, activists engaging directly against um, extractivism and so on and so on. But at the level of state relationship, obviously, then that's where we have the issue of sub imperialism playing a role a, a, a very very strongly. So we need to engage more in this struggle. We need to, uh, I mean, make sure that uh, the, the government does not have the, the, the opportunity to continue uh, uh, investing in this sub sub uh, opting for the sub imperialist relation and investing further on, on imperialism. Mozambique does not uh, uh, contribute much today, but it begins and begins to allow for space for this um, uh, multi extractivist uh, companies to come and exploit and its economy is becoming more and more reliant on extractivism which in future might also obviously i mean ethically obviously there's already a problem but in terms of of of, uh, of uh, its actual contribution to uh, global climate change it's not it's not yet uh, to be considered a, 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 a alarming yeah but obviously things have to be done yeah. thank you so both you and vision your presentation um did begin on speaking some of your recommendations or solutions in terms of transformative um, alternatives towards, um, you know, addressing some of these matters. But this is just another opportunity to reiterate in this space, um, now that we're on the topic, I think just to thread well with what Patrick and Fredson have contributed, Farrell. Thanks, Awande. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that for me, in terms of the the kind of practical things that we can do, you know, this this the charter, the climate justice charter sets out quite a bit that we can do, and one of which is to 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 actually start monitoring what governments are doing and having more of a say and um, engagement in in those in changing policies, and so that must be something that we can do practically is voicing our opinions, changing policy, as well as, well, we've been working with activist citizen science. And sometimes when you're dealing with issues around water, it, you know, there's a tendency to say, well, you don't know because, you know, you're not a scientist or you don't know because you haven't tested that water, but taking back and owning knowledge and owning basic understanding of the water around us um, actually pushes the power power lines and it challenges power so they have to engage with people on the ground and those are practical things that can be done in terms of policy in terms of solutions as well so yeah i'm answering that question in particular but there were a few so just let me know if there's something else you want me to answer um thank you feral um and this just finally with you and this question with regards to recommendations and solutions given also that your presentation really took us through what disaster looks like on the ground and what neglect and government failure looks like also and you touched on those um alternatives those transformative alternatives um and seeing as you were the best on time i think uh it would be good for us to give you the space then to go deeper into that thanks thanks and one day um, i'm not going to put on my 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 kind of video because of um 
bad connection. So I think we must start with the complexity of uh, the crisis we're living. It's, it is a poly crisis. Uh, there are many dimensions to it. Uh, it's historically specific. And each of these dimensions are feeding into each other, interlocking, interconnecting, cascading, etc. Uh, so, and each of these dimensions is a poly crisis in itself. I mean, I think this is what I wanted to demonstrate with my photographs. When you just look at climate, it's not one thing right now, okay? As the earth is responding, as the rupture in the earth system deepens with more oil, coal, and gas, we are seeing various things hit us, okay? Uh, we are being hit by all kinds of climate extremes. Uh, so that's just the climate poly crisis. So I really think that when we're thinking the problem, we cannot be reductionist and say, okay, this is one thing, this is the problem, okay? I mean, the more we kind of try to um, deepen oil and gas extraction in the context of oil peak, it feeds back. Uh, the more we kind of crank up industrial agriculture and its emissions, it, it feeds back and vice versa and so on and so on. So I really think that... Um, we got to think the crisis holistically in all its complexity. And we have to do that at two levels. I mean, the one is the macro intervention. Uh, we really need a new direction for the country. Uh, and the one big idea that we are advancing is the idea of a climate justice deal, a, a new climate emergency social contract for the society uh, as a means to confront uh, this poly crisis. Um, and that means that we've got to build a whole new consensus in this country to tackle this poly crisis and, um, and basically re-gear the state and to re-embed the state, et cetera. I mean, part of, that, part of that climate emergency social contract is, of course, recognizing those that are contributing to the problem have to carry the greatest burden. And the data is very clear. The rich have the largest carbon footprints, both historically and in the present and so on. The other level at which we got to tackle this problem is we got to treat it as a post-normal problem, which means that it's got to be owned by all of society. The moment we normalize this problem and think parties are going to solve it or technocrats are going to solve it or business is going to solve it, we are making a very, very fundamental mistake. Basically, society has to own the problem. And that means from below, uh, we've got to be opening up pathways around the deep just transition, around water, around food systems, et cetera, in communities, uh, in workplaces, in sectors, et cetera. This is the kind of political strategic approach we need. Um, so one day I may not be talking about specifics, but um, if we are able to kind of meet the moment and meet the crisis in a way that can provide a positive social tipping point, I'm arguing that we need a transformative politics more than anything else. Thanks. Thank you. And I think that also touches on uh, the next question by Khalid, which asked about uh, if there was access to funding uh, and what would the panelists uh, prioritize as prominent for uh, changing energy in the landscape with regards to the jet and how do we pursue decarbonization without being assessed as neoliberal agents? And I think um, your intervention this, uh, specifically spoke to the transformative aspect going beyond that um, and not fitting ourselves within frameworks which are not fitting the scope and the level of scale required for the problem um, and not tying our hands around that. But I'd like to give uh, others also the opportunity. I think that in some way you may have touched on this, but if not, um, beginning with you, Patrick, um, and then also just to say that I did see another hand uh, from the chat, but I've lost that hand. So please, if you would still like to ask that question, just keep your hand up and I'll come to you next, uh, Patrick. Okay, thanks. I'll try to be brief, but the point I uh, just raised uh, momentarily, uh, but I think we really could uh, spend much more time, maybe I challenge you, dear comrades, to have a special session on this, is climate sanctions that would generate funds. There is such a vehicle. So the Jet P, I would argue, is not that vehicle. It's it's rotten. Uh, it's a carrot, but, but not nutritious. It's rotten. And one reason is that it's trusting ESCOM, uh, which has a plan under Andre de Reiter, but continuing, 
to use 44% of its capital expenditure to do methane gas. That would be the blood methane um, that's closest to us. So let's do as CJCM uh, has, has, has encouraged and, and, and call for sanctions or, or, or our comrades in, in the West, in the US, uh, UK and Europe to stop funding JetP. It's a farcical. And uh, instead of closing coal-fired power plants early, um, we're seeing them actually being planned in the uh, integrated resource plan, our IRP from Gwede Montage, to keep them open longer. But I'll just throw out very quickly the next challenge. The stick, uh, which is a broken twig, the carrot is rotten. The stick is the CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, climate sanctions. And there could be money in that. That is to say, revenues taken in. So for Khalid's uh, question, uh, revenues that the Europeans in 2026 and the Brits in 2027, and I'm pretty sure if Trump comes to power, they'll do whatever sanctions they're going to do, because that's the orientation that uh, imperialist protectionists like Trump will, will promote. They'll be putting on climate sanctions against South Africa's aluminium and steel, automobiles, petrochemicals. Now, I will welcome sanctions that close those industries down because I desperately think uh, and I know everybody in the house agrees that electricity that's being abused should be given to labor intensive industry, small businesses, households, especially where there's such an obvious gender dimension given patriarchy and who does the cooking, who does the, the house chores that require electricity. Now, if we can get pressure to build up that makes climate sanctions an appropriate response to the fossil addiction in Pretoria, then we should also say to the regimes in Brussels and in uh, London, you guys have to use the revenues that you're bringing in through your carbon border adjustment mechanism, a huge tariff on imports from high carbon products like South Africa's. You have to use that to pay the people adversely affected, the people like in Numsa, Numa, Amku, who are going to be shut out of their jobs because of these very important, vitally needed climate sanctions against our minerals energy complex. I don't know if anyone would agree with me, but I doubt third worldists and those who are dogmatic, economistic labor uh, advocates. And we have plenty in this country and plenty in the BRICS who oppose climate sanctions against mostly Western corporates, BHP Billiton, Sassel, and the others that use most of it. I really think, though, it's time for you, dear comrades, in the House to come up with a position. Are you in favor or against the carbon border adjustment mechanism? And can we make a, a demand to raise money for proper climate uh, just transition work or uh, loss and damage funding or whatever it's going to be from the revenues that come in from carbon border adjustment mechanism, climate sanctions. I throw it to you all as a, as a challenge. Thanks, comrades. Thank you. Um, and then to our next question to all the panelists from Percy, uh, who ask, how has climate change uh, affected migration patterns, uh, policy formulation and politics across Central and Southern Africa. I think I'd like to begin uh, with Fredson uh, first uh, with regards to this question in terms of uh, looking at your analysis on cyclones and what's been happening in Mozambique, for example, how has this impacted uh, migration patterns, uh, policy formulation and politics uh, within that part of the region? Yeah, Percy, thank you very much for the question. It's not necessarily in my area of uh, research, but, um, you know, as I have come across uh, some uh, um, analysis which actually point that, you know, uh, some uh, xenophobic um, uh, uh, tensions in South Africa have been exacerbated by uh, migrants running away from Zimbabwe here, running away precisely, uh, uh, or, I mean, uh, f um, of, um, uh, I mean, the droughts uh, caused by by climate change. And I don't know if this has to be verified by others, but what it, it at least points is to that, you know, climate is currently leading into more uh, uh, migration, people running away from their own areas of production and so on, running into areas where they have running from, from town, I mean, from the countryside into urban areas to find um, means uh, for their living. And definitely there is some, uh, there's a pattern of my, migration that is being influenced by by climate change and this can be actually explained globally if you look at what what what's happening in in, in Senegal 
as well. Uh, and, I mean, lots of um, uh, um, areas, coastal areas being uh, affected and people uh, running into Europe because they cannot, they need to sustain their families. So there is a very strong interconnection, but the responses as we see, as we can see is actually uh, the, the very polluters, I mean, uh, having to, I mean, uh, I mean, coming up with blocking, blocking uh, migrants from uh, coming into their their countries. People who are actually behind uh, these problems. But I would like to uh, move into, I mean, following what 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 Patrick was saying. I mean, since we're talking about about suggestion, I'm not sure if I'm gonna, I'm gonna have more time later because I was talking when I I I, I when I, when I exceeded my time. I was talking about transformative um, alternatives and which also links to what Vish said. And one of them, which that I said here is food, so is food sovereignty or agroecology. I, I, I mean, which in my research is being, was, is being used locally by grassroots movements as a form of response to the ecological crisis. Because as we, this also, Agroecology, I believe, it it also respond, responds to many of the poly crises. I mean, the consequences of poly crises as well that Vish was mentioning here, for example, because it takes into account, I mean, uh, women's right. It takes into account issues related to the control of local market by of markets by the local producers by peasants themselves, and also uh, production of of food that takes into account the 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 relationship between uh, humans and nature. So we need to emphasize more and support these uh, transformative alternatives, grassroots transformative alternatives that are coming from from the movements. And I think in South Africa, uh, here, uh, I mean, food, the Food Sovereignty Campaign is doing a lot of a lot of work on that. But also elsewhere in Brazil, MST is uh, advancing significantly agroecology and food sovereignty as well. So that's that. Just wanted to to add that element to my my intervention. Thank you. Sorry, I wonder you are muted. Sorry, thank you, Charles. I was saying, uh, Lumumba, thank you for your hand. I do see it there, so just keep it up because we will get to your question next. But I do want to give Ferial an opportunity uh, to uh, respond with regards to this question, with regards to um, particularly from the water perspective on how that has affected migration patterns regionally, but also within uh, South Africa, and particularly given that we're in an elections moment also, um, what's the effect this issue has had on policy formulation and politics in South Africa also, just to speak a bit more on that. Thanks, Sawande. In terms of migration um, in, in central parts um, of Southern Africa, I think that um, if we just, you know, if we look at a little bit more than central, there have been quite a bit of migration happening, uh, particularly around, I think, uh, Kenya and Lake Turkana, where a lot of people have been moving south. So, um, and that is because of the increased uh, dry conditions that people are facing. This has also led to, by the way, um, a bit of, um, I would say, war or fighting between Kenya and Ethiopia. So I think it does start then creating those water wars that we have spoken about previously. So that is happening at that at that point in in within a country, um, there has been a greater move away from areas, and some towns in South Africa have actually become dead towns because of the lack of water. Um, what were previously, you know, business have gone bust, etc. So people are moving to bigger cities, and that places even more stress on the water situation within the metros. Um, in terms of policy, I think government is in denial. Uh, they just keep talking about population increase, but they don't look at the understanding of what those, why those cities have been increasing. What are the challenges? They've, so they're not connecting the dots. And for as long as they don't connect those dots, they're seeing these things as isolated activities rather than a bigger systemic issue. And, and, and the policy reflects that as well. So the policies are weak on that, and the policies are also not uh, dealing with the kind of challenges we're seeing in a much bigger kind of um, response. 
Um, and for as long as they do that, the situation is actually going to only get worse. Thank you, Farrell. And um, I've actually saved uh, Vish for last on this question because I think it connects uh, with Farrell's input more closely, uh, given the picture on the ground that you've painted for us in your presentation, Vish. Um, just your input on this question, uh, given that you've also visited these different areas uh, and communities, just to give us a greater sense with regards to what that looks like also regarding migration and also how that's affected politics on the ground also. Now, Wendy, I mean, I don't have verifiable sort of research, but it's clear that unlivability was looming large in some of these smaller towns and so on. And, uh, you know, particularly the unemployment dynamic as well. Um, and I'm sure, as Ferial says, there's movement out of these communities. Um, you know, in, in Madagascar, for example, they've been hit very, very hard in the southern part of the country. You know, two cyclones and then a big drought. And by 2021, the world's first climate famine. Uh, 400,000 people impacted, over a million in food stress. But that also led to migration out of the south of Madagascar, which led to internal conflicts within Madagascar itself. Uh, some of the data I've looked at um, suggests that with climate impacts and shocks, we'll have between 120 to 200 million people on the move uh, in Africa. And, and I think that's already begun. Uh, but I think this is why climate justice as part of a new left transformative politics has to really be at the forefront of renewing a radical pan-Africanism. This is fundamental. It's fundamental to ensure we don't veer off into xenophobia and we keep the big picture in perspective. Uh, it's fundamental also that we can unite Africa to respond collectively uh, to these crises. I mean, right now, Zambia has just declared uh, a national food disaster. Uh, Zimbabwe is also kind of really getting pummeled by the El Nino and levels of climate heating right now uh, in terms of droughts and food crisis, et cetera. We need a collective climate emergency response on the continent, including to bargain with the global north around the resources we have for the green or just transition on a planetary scale, whether it's the copper, whether it's the cobalt, uh, whether it's other strategic minerals and resources. And so, again, we must not separate out this migration issue from a larger political challenge. And that, for me, is renewing radical pan-Africanism and the solidarities that go with that. Thanks. Thank you. I think that's such a great connection with um, what's happening in the communities, the question of livability, but also how it comes back to the pan-African and the a continental perspective of our role and our position with regards to how we manage this crisis in relation to the needs, our needs and the needs of the global north. Uh, Lumumba, uh, can we take your question now? Um, thank you for your patience. I think you should be able to speak. We'll just ask that you unmute, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, first of all, greetings to all of you. Uh, and I have to thank um, um, uh, the organizers um, because this is really was a very rich uh, contribution from the, all the speakers. Um, I have two small questions. The first one is related to what uh, uh, Vishy was just talking about. Given the fact that we face a poly a, 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 a multiple multifaceted uh, and interconnected system failure globally. We now effectively at a time when the earth is becoming uninhabitable. Uh, you've seen the report um, recently that um, water stress in Africa is well above 80%. In Rio, real temperature reads 62.3, okay, in terms of heat. So 
my question, therefore, from a system perspective, and I totally agree with, uh, although I have a different perspective on what is the origin of the crisis, the origin of the crisis, this is a, a civilizational crisis at multi levels, new, new liberalism, all the way to climate crisis, all to and the rest. So shouldn't the, therefore the transformative policies be centered around, at least in developing countries, towards finding a new uh, 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 developmental state for these times of hyper-imperialism uh, uh, and systemic failure from poverty, from energy poverty, all the way to stress, et cetera, et cetera. Because it's only through a developmental state that we can then build foundations for arresting what we are witnessing in most African states and developing countries, which is state failure. Failing states phenomena that we are witnessing, like what's uh, 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 Vish was speaking about in, in South Africa cannot be addressed without addressing the questions of development and therefore resi resilience, economic resilience, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the first thing that I wanted to raise. The second thing I wanted to raise is to do with um, uh, uh, the eloquent um, uh, presentation by uh, Professor Bond. I want to go back to Mauro Marini's original perspective on the dialectics of dependency. Is it really that we are emerging from dependency to sub-imperialism? Or is it that actually we are emerging from dependency to appendaging and becoming avengers for the hyper empire? Thank you. Thank you for those two questions. I think I'll pose them then. Uh, the first to uh, Vish on the developmental uh, stability and robustness uh, required to address these issues. I think in particular, uh, this question touches to uh, what you said, Vish, with regards to um, transformative framework of the climate justice deal um, and transformative macro interventions. And then yeah. I'll hand over the second question to you, Patrick, uh, once Vish is done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lumumba. Those are great questions. Um, yeah, I mean, this question of the state is something that's also been foremost in my mind as I've been traveling the country over the past few years and thinking the, the sort of realities from bottom up. And um, I mean, I do think I do think that we are at an impasse in terms of how we think the state and, and the kind of state form we require. Um, neoliberalism, as you know, has been weakening and hollowing out and remaking the form of the state, its competencies, its functions, its role, et cetera, and increasingly straightjacketing it as a market actor. And so it's it's been losing capacity, uh, even around the provisioning of public goods, uh, even around ensuring uh, certain requirements for, for, if you like, public protection. Uh, and they were all tested during COVID-19. And you could see how states came short, uh, these, if you like, neoliberal states. I would call it the Afro-neoliberal state in the African context. Um, but I do think that we, you know, we can't go back to this competition neoliberal state the developmental state is one example of a 20th century state that led industrial development. But again, I'm not sure if that is the framework uh, that we should be reaching for. I want to argue that, again, we need a whole new vision and, and we need a whole new conception of the state uh, to face the poly crisis and the climate emergency we are facing. Uh, I'm busy with the final volume in the series that I edit on democratic Marxism. And it's about this question. Uh, it's about rethinking the state in the context of polycrisis, complexity, the just transition. We don't have the answers, but I think 
with some very powerful case studies that will come to the fore in that project, um, whether it's from Kerala, India, and how they've dealt with flooding and Nipah virus and COVID, or whether it's uh, from Mozambique uh, and going more deeper with what uh, Fretzen has been sharing with us uh, around lessons to be learned from that, etc. Basically, state bureaucracies um, are right now, in my view, incapable of dealing with multiple shocks. I mean, they can't even handle poverty, okay? Uh, imagine layers and compounded crisis upon crisis, et cetera. Uh, and therefore, we've got to think about a conception of the state that is deeply uh, embedded in society, driven by democratizing logics and so on. Um, so yes, this may not be an answer, uh, but I'm saying that we have to move in the direction of a whole new approach to the state. The final quick point I'll make, and this is this is my 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 jibe at, at Patrick. Um, we've never had a decolonial moment in Africa. Uh, we've had colonialism, we've had neo-colonialism, and we've had U.S. Uh, neoliberal domination of our continent, and um, and that's what we are living through. There are moments where countries like South Africa and so on navigate this, and of course they assert themselves and try to kind of, if you like, curry favor with the hubs and spokes of the U.S., but it also contradicts that in other ways as well. Um, and I think we really got to keep that front and center uh, as we debate these questions of imperialism and sub-imperialism. Thanks. Uh, Patrick? Yes, great. Uh, thank you, Vish, for that. I mean, I think uh, um, the way Lumumba, who knows this so well from having been the negotiator in uh, Copenhagen and seeing the alliance, the basic group, come up with their Copenhagen Accord, uh, encouraged by uh, Barack Obama to basically say we won't uh, have meaningful cuts and we won't have any liability. That, to me, is the imperial sub-imperial relationship that you can draw out of Marini, if I can very quickly restate it, it's simply that for Marini, a very super exploitative condition, such as the Brazilian society, which at that time uh, was number one in inequality in the world, um, and with a dependency relationship, which included lots of foreign companies that were making local luxury goods. So that made Brazil in the 60s, very similar to South Africa. Um, secondly, with um, over accumulation of capital and Brazilian capital moving into the region as a result. And thirdly, with antagonistic collaboration and cooperation with uh, particularly US corporates who had to do some turf wars uh, in Latin America to divide the spoils of that sub-imperialism. Eduardo Galeano also wrote beautifully about those contradictions of Brazilian capital moving up and um, South Africa and uh, US capital moving down. So I think that is actually a very good book. I put the, the URL if anyone's interested. Um, I think what uh, we've done to update it is a little bit more on the global scale of over accumulation crisis. It is certainly no doubt about it being driven by overcapacity on the east coast of China, usually about 30 to 40%, hence the Belt and Road Initiative. Nobody disputes that, that this is the sort of drive for Chinese capital to move out because they've overproduced for the local market. And thirdly, that there's a multilateral relationship, which the BRICS play with sometimes very um, in hostile ways, sometimes in very uh, contradictory ways. We saw it in the COVID-19 vaccine debacle where uh, both the Indian and South African uh, states were demanding the um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines and treatment be given without intellectual property, but the Chinese and the Russians actually needed their intellectual property on their uh, their Sputnik and um, Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines. Um, and Brazil, of course, at that time under uh, uh, the uh, right-wing regime, uh, was pushing uh, you know, the opposite of what South Africa and India wanted. So these are contradictions that at the multilateral level will only become more extreme. I'm sure you see it yourself, Lumumba, knowing the UAE as well as you do, seeing Iran and Saudi Arabia temporarily in a truce, but re with real uh, underlying tensions and with US imperialism, still trying to make sure Egypt, UAE, and now Saudi Arabia at some point uh, normalize relations with Israel. So those are some of the tensions that I think mean our antagonistic collaboration, uh, our multilateral scenes like UNFCCC, where it really is another conference of polluters. Maybe it'll be a bit better in Brazil in 2025 when it's going to be hosted in the Amazon in Belém. And certainly with the corporates in these countries, 
over accumulating um, and doing all kinds of deals with each other and needing military support, as we see with South African troops um, defending South African predatory capital in the eastern DRC in northern Mozambique uh, to terrible effect. So I, I do hope we can all take that one up as well. And not only these days, of course, as we must be anti-imperialist, but also appropriately anti-sub-imperialist. Thanks, comrades. And Ferial's Ferial just typed, it's, it's, it's useless under current power relations to expect the COP to get anywhere. I completely agree. And I think uh, the delegitimization, especially of this year's COP, is absolutely vital and finding some alternative systems. Um, in the last uh, COP, there was an attempt by our friends in Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance to toss out um, Sultan al Jaber, but it wasn't successful. And he just did the kind of awful deals we'd expected. Um, so if you have any other ideas of what we should be doing, when in uh, late November, early December, Azerbaijan hosts the COP uh, Conference of Polluters uh, 29, before Lula hosts the COP 30 in Belém in 2025, it'd be great to, to have uh, CJCM doing some uh, advice on that as well. A sentiment I think we all share uh, in the space, but it's worth repeating and also focusing on. Um, just, I'd like to let everyone know that um, we're officially over time, um, as we've now come past one. So I'd like to give our last two speakers, Freston and Ferial, uh, just a brief moment to uh, give their reflections as we close this session today. So Freston, I'll begin with you. And then we'll end off with Feral before we close today's session. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I just wanted to maybe uh, finish uh, with uh, my a theoretical contribution from my own thesis is that uh, I mean, um, in in th that um, while states respond to cyclone cyclonic events like climate change from a humanitarian perspective alone, um, uh, progressive social movements organizations on the ground they come up with transformative um, alternatives like agroecology as i said so this is this is this is to say that i mean on the ground there are counter movement transformative counter movement taking place and to to finalize just to touch a little bit on what, what vicious skepticism uh, to uh, trans, uh, develop, developmental state that lumumba was talking about i think uh, i share the same skepticism because a dependent state is a form of a, a capitalism, is a form of a capitalist state. The only difference is that from predatory state is that the dependent state, I mean, uses the industrialization, I mean, the gains from industrialization for some sort of um, a development um, of its, its population. But it continues relying very much on extractivism uh, for development. It continues disrupting, disrupting nature. Um, and and life cycle everything. So I think we actually need need, need to reflect on some form uh, some uh, different forms of state where we would have a, a much um, a amicable relationship with nature that the grassroots organization grassroots movements are proposing when they talk about food food sovereignty and when they talk about agroecology. Uh, thank you very much um, for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Awande. Uh, Thanks, Awande. You weren't clear, but I'm assuming you say I must go ahead because of time. Um, I think many of the issues have uh, yes. been covered. Many of the issues have been covered. I, I, I think that we, I couldn't, you know, I agree with what everyone has been saying, but I think that there's just a few things I want to stress, and it's been coming out in different ways from everyone's discussion is that uh, in times of crisis, like we're seeing now, is that we have, we have the ability to build our resistance and to build the messages of the Climate Justice Charter movement and the, the Climate Justice Charter is very important. We need to strengthen local so that we can build bottom-up approaches. And I think the one thing I think I must say is that in South Africa, we tend to be very inward looking and we have to look at cross-border solidarities because it's very weak at the moment. And that I think is where we need to go given the stresses and strains that we're experiencing both in climate and water. Thanks, Com. Thank you, Farrell. And thank you to all our speakers. Um, this was a very informative uh, presentations, but a very uh, informative discussion that we've had including the questions that we've gotten from the chat. And I think that 
uh, we've all gained a lot from this discussion. So this concludes our sessions on disasters in Southern Africa, uh, learning lessons for transformation. But in closing, I'd also like to thank um, the Brazil Hub, um, the World Systems Crisis uh, Research Group on Political Economy of World Systems, um, and the Emancipatory Future Studies uh, Group also for hosting, uh, co-hosting this session. Um, just to let everyone know that uh, this recording will be up on the EFS site, um, but it will also be up on the Global Disasters Conference webpage also. So for all those who'd like to revisit or share this conversation, uh, it will be up. So please do take a look at those pages um, just so that you are able to have a copy of this recording. So with that, once again, I'd like to thank our panelists and our speakers for your time today and for this very informative session, but also to everyone who attended the session also and for your contributions in making this uh, an informative and stimulating discussion. So once again, thank you, all of you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>